So good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Quincy Koziel, and Surin Bina will be uh, presenting with me about the um, ECP work we're doing on HDF5 and a tiny bit about other aspects of HDF5 and other projects we're collaborating on. This um, will start off with a brief, hopefully 10 minute-ish um, intro to HDF5 just to kind of refresh everybody's notions of things and give you a little bit of bootstrap in case you haven't seen it before. I think most people have. And then talk mainly about the actual ECP work that uh, we're working on and the applications we're engaged with. So HDF5 wise, um, HDF5 stands for Hierarchical Data Format Version 5. Um, don't let that fool you. Version 5 is not compatible with versions 1 through 4, just for fun. Um, but uh, HDF5 is basically composed of three uh, important aspects. Uh, it's an extensible data model that uh, allows you to organize your data in a reasonably scientifically organized um, perspective. Um, there's a software package that comes with it, uh, a whole IO library and lots of command line tools. There's a very large ecosystem built around that and um, basically uh, does all the IO according to the data model um, through the APIs that we give people. Um, there's lots and lots and lots of different ways you can operate on HDF5 data. Traditionally, it's been through POSIX, but you can reach out into the Amazon cloud or object stores like Deus or other ones, um, native memory, and, and if you want to operate in RAM, and pretty much anything else. There's a lot of extension points for reaching out there. Uh, the third aspect that we won't even touch on today is the, the file format that is um, corresponding to the, uh, the data model. So data model is kind of the abstract programming, what you think about and whiteboard about. Software is what you program to, and the files are what you get at the very bottom. So HDF5 is designed for a few things, primarily uh, high volume, complex data. Um, gigabytes are common these days, um, you know, easily much larger than that as we go along. And it's not uncommon to start hitting up into the petabyte zone. Um, we have ported the library and I've had bug reports and interesting discussions with people from every different level of the hierarchy from embedded systems and feature phones requests by Nokia in the early 2000s, uh, all the way on up, of course, to supercomputers that we have today and in the future. It's very flexible. Um, as I said earlier, you can do storage in lots of different container formats on the, on the back end and um, portable also out through lots and lots of different um, languages and application wrappers for um, different levels of abstraction to your community's science format. Uh, we really try to have um, a flexible model that allows the apps to evolve and let them add new things and rearrange things and the data can still be accessed for a very long time. Um, that's kind of the final thing here. We have petabytes, maybe even exabytes, uh, remote sensing data that's been accumulated by NASA and lots of other people. Um, and they expect to get that data back in 50 years. You know, climate simulations um, need accurate, long-term, real measurements. Um, and uh, that's part of NASA's goal and one of the reasons why they funded development on HDF5. Other pieces like the DOA uh, and NSA labs uh, really place a very high value on retention and archiving and other aspects of data preservation also. So, uh, At a high level, uh, HDF5 files are containers that hold a bunch of objects that you create. The different types of science can be uh, described and, and stored well in there. Um, the containers look a lot like um, an object-oriented uh, situation. There's a file and then there's data sets, groups, and attributes, uh, kind of the main high-level concepts. And um, links and data types and data space are kind of supporting aspects of the file uh, data model and uh, API. We'll talk very, very briefly a little bit about how these look, but we've got lots of other tutorials on um, more aspects of stronger pieces of the programming model and data model and things. So, if you want to store all these uh, data objects, you know, images and three-dimensional 
um, arrays, tables of things, you know, output from your biz tools. Um, this is all really useful, but it would be awfully better if we could organize it in a nicely structured way that says, hey, uh, in this file, I've got some visualization um, output and some simulation data that's maybe checkpoints or something else and um, nicely organize it in typically a hierarchical manner. HDF5 um, allows you to create um, graphs, but most people choose trees. This is kind of a trivial graph in a sense. The, the viz uh, group in this file has uh, a link to this table, latitude, longitude, and temperature. And so this is a simulation. Maybe it's input data for the simulation and also some coordinate uh, correlation for the visualization. But it's not replicated. It's just shared and pointed to by both of those groups in the hierarchy. Uh, also, this off to the side here, we're saying, hey, this um, group in HDF5 can point to data in another container. So there's a mechanism for having external links out into other HDF5 files and other uh, what we would consider raw files of just arrays and types. So very high level, how do we organize things in HDF5? Uh, everything starts at the root group. And um, I really need to go take that little link out of there. Um, architecturally, so diving down into software, most of this talk is about software. Um, the API that HDF5, the very top, is what most of the um, applications program to. Sometimes there's another layer of more domain specific science uh, libraries that people are programming to, but HDF5 proper um, is a public API and some language bindings. And then Immediately below that, and I'll describe it a little bit more in, later on the talk, we have this new virtual object layer that abstracts out components that deal with storing data, and that's mostly what we're interested in here, um, and allows data to be passed through several different pluggable layers. Each one of these um, boxes in here, the vol connectors, are different pluggable mechanisms for doing storage to a particular um, destination. So you can store Amazon S3 with a REST driver or to the Deus object store. Various other file formats are even possible here as Venus Adios is one of the connectors that we have. And over here on the left, um, we provide a native connector to POSIX and that also has extensions to do efficient. Um, typically collective is how you get efficient for MPI, but um, independent as well. And then single writer multiple reader for kind of experimental observational data and lots of different ways that go out through the POSIX file format over there. But these other mechanisms, you can store data any way you'd like um, through the virtual object there. I'll talk, like I say, a little bit more about this general later. Programming. Um, C, Fortran, Java, and C++ ship with the main HDF5 um, package. Um, the namespacing that we were able to create, uh, push on a little bit in C, is everything starts with H5. So then a character that determines what kind of object you're operating on. So when you see HDF5 programming APIs, everything that starts with H5 is an HDF5 call. And then Ds for, will be data set calls, and Fs for files, S for data space. Uh, there's several other uh, prefixes that we use. But you can kind of read through it, and it looks a little bit like C++ methods jammed into C as much as we can. Um, I gotta fix this here. There are more than 300 APIs one can start with, just a few though. And um, some of those guys allow you to do optional tweaking on the um, files or the objects or the access that you do. So we will we'll talk occasionally about seeing properties in an object or in an access mode. And then that should change chunking storage or choose a different I.O. driver to access the file. Um, but then generally you, you open and create an object, you access it, and you close it. It's kind of a very C-oriented programming model, very standard. This is what a simple skeleton would look like. Create the file, create a data space that's the dimensionality of the data set, then go create the data set, access it, close things down. Pretty straightforward. In the parallel world, knife is a little bit more complex, though. The 
number of factors that you're dealing with goes up quite a bit. Uh, it's not just HDF5 writing to POSIX, but it's more HDF5 talking to MPI, interfacing to the parallel file system, and then a complicated set of things at the bottom and for the storage hardware. It's not just the hard drive. This sort of system here is kind of very familiar to HPC people, but um, typically your compute nodes talk over some interconnect down into IO servers and metadata servers that handle the file system aspects and the bulk data transfers, then off into the hardware um, through some storage area network and lots of rating and disks and possibly um, NVRAM uh, these days, I would say. So typical, this is what we have in the world with HPC, but um, it's moving more and more distributed and stretching out. Um, not only here at the storage end, but also memory is getting more hierarchical with uh, high bandwidth memory and other things. So we're trying to stretch and move HDF5 in ways that can support these really nicely. Another aspect of um, how applications do I.O., typically parallel I.O., um, many of them um, traditionally have done a file per processor, which is scales very nicely um, until you start beating the file system and it dies. Um, lots of times the metadata and the file system has been a bottleneck um, and a huge performance impact and if you kept going that direction. Um, it kind of pushes people to either one way or the other here, either a shared file where everybody drops data in kind of independently or they aggregate their data to some subnet of the nodes in their application and then perform IO in larger chunks at least. Um, so apps can either do this bottom set of collective buffering on their own or hand it off to MPIO and trade offs either way. Um, I do tend to encourage people to go with MPI collectives. At least there's a knowledgeable bunch of people who understand it and do that all day long every day and can optimize for you. So from HDF5's perspective, um, still get into sort of a, a very large number of moving pieces. Um, we try very hard to work with all the layers below us, but um, that's a little tricky. So um, when you do use, again, this is wrapping up the sort of tutorial part of this. Um, when you're using HDF5 in parallel mode, um, that parallel HDF5 allows multiple MPI uh, processes uh, in the MPI application to perform IO to a single HDF5. You could choose multiple files, but single one is the norm typically now. Um, we layer on top of MPI. You can move your app across platforms very nicely. Um, the files that you create with parallel HDF5 are exactly HDF5 files. They're exactly the same as you would get um, if you wrote that data sequentially on your laptop or desktop or whatever. Um, so there's, they're totally portable between the platforms that you create the data and move things around. And there's a few little bits of extra API calls and um, you know bells and whistles to go apply to that, but we really are going to try to stay focused on the ECP feature side of things for today. So there's many many tutorials on parallel HDF5 and how to do that well, and I'll leave that to that aspect of things. So I'll turn things over to Surin here um, to talk a little bit more about the application side of things. All right. So uh, I'm Surin Baina from. Uh, CRD. So I will be talking about the ECP project uh, that is called XIO HDF5. Uh, we were previously known as XIHDF5, but recently we have been merged into two, two uh, major projects have been merged and uh, both of them are supporting IO. So we are calling it the XIO uh, team. So several applications in the ECP, a majority of them are using HDF5 file format. Uh, so we, uh, at the Berkeley and Argonne and HDF group have formed this team a while ago called XHDF5, and then we are continuing that uh, same team. Uh, the, going to the next slide, quickly. 
Um, the mission of the XHDFI project was, has been working with the ECP applications and making sure those applications perform well and also work with the facilities to meet the HDFI IO requirements. Uh, I will be talking a bit about uh, some of these applications today and uh, we, uh, Quincy would uh, switch to productizing the HDFI features and also the R&D toward uh, future architectures that we are doing right now. Okay, next slide. So we are interacting with a large number of teams. Uh, this lists some of the applications that we are uh, working with and what type of engagement we are doing and the uh, uh, POCs for these. Uh, for example, some of the applications are at uh, LBL, subsurface simulation uh, that is uh, uh, at LBL. We have been working with them uh, when Chambo uh, started. So it's been a while and we optimized the performance for that team. And EQSIM is another uh, application that we have been working with uh, recently. Uh, we are integrating HDFI IO for their uh, main code called SW4. I'll talk a bit more about that. Warpex is a uh, uh, Berkeley code uh, that is using H uh, HDFI through H5Pi. Uh, then XFL we have been, uh, is at uh, uh, Slack. We have been working with them. Uh, in optimizing performance using swimmer uh, enhancements. XSky is another uh, uh, co uh, uh, code that from Argon, uh, and we have been tuning their performance. And Nix is another code uh, at the LBL. Uh, we integrated HDFI into their, into their code and uh, optimized it performance. I'll go into the next slide. Uh, we are also working with various uh, software technology teams in the ECP portfolio. Uh, for example, Audios has been working with us uh, in developing a virtual object layer uh, plugin or connector uh, for uh, reading and writing Audios BB data. Uh, so we are also working with our team to provide some in situ capabilities for HDF5. Uh, Jun Min Gu, uh, who is on the call, has been working on those aspects a bit. Uh, with the data lib team from Argon, we are working uh, on a couple of things. One is the virtual object layer uh, connector for PNET CDF data, and also uh, one of the most useful team, uh, useful topics maybe uh, the Darshan profiling for HDF5 which is being added uh, right now and a developer version is available right now. So that uh, captures the profiling for HDF5 calls, such as HDF5 open, uh, close, file open, file close, data set, create, data set, read, write, and uh, flush operations. So that gives us uh, how to identify the bottlenecks in HDF5, uh, performance bottlenecks in HDF5. So that, and that would be one of the um, very useful tools. We're also working with uh, Unify FS, which is a, um, a, unify, a unified node local storage uh, single namespace, uh, uh, namespace work. So we, they are part of our work, uh, our project, and uh, we are closely working with them in developing the HDF5 API uh, in, their, in their system. Okay, going to the next slide. Now I'll go through some of these applications uh, and um, talk a bit more about it. Next slide in the EQSIM. Uh, the EQSIM is a high performance regional scale earthquake uh, hazard, hazard and uh, risk assessment code. Uh, the main code there is called uh, SW4. Um, we are working with that team in uh, converting various files that they have been using uh, as a custom binary or ASCII formats, and we are now converting all those into HDF5 file, uh, file format. Uh, and as a result of that, that uh, their code will automatically be portable to uh, various uh, visualization tools, as well as the performance is also improving there. So the, the uh, HDF5 instances where we are converting are uh, listed in red here. Uh, so they, previously they, they had an ASCII-based R file, now we converted into binary S file. 
uh, and then those uh, reading those uh, uh, HDFI files and then pr um, produce the data through simulation would be written into HDFI files as well. And the visualization tools are also developed by some of the, uh, our team members for them. The next slide. Uh, this shows the performance of EQ SIM compared to what uh, they had previously. Uh, the S file approach, which uses the HDF file, uh, gives much better performance uh, than what they were using before. Uh, and also, when we write the data, time series data uh, with the different uh, numbers of processes to Lustre and uh, Cor uh, Lustre and Corey's uh, burst buffer. Uh, HDF5 is performing somewhat similar to their uh, file per process approach, which is SAC, uh, SAC approach, uh, uh, and much better than their uh, ASCII, uh, ASCII format that they previously had. Uh, on the first buffer, we, HDF5 is much faster. Uh, I believe this is uh, because of the small data writes and when they're when you're writing small uh, small data uh, rand and it goes into random axis and, and burst buffer it's much faster compared to writing single uh, single file uh, from process or uh, ascii formats okay going to the next slide we are working with the amrex uh, team as well uh, this is a co-design center uh, building massively parallel block structure to adapt to mesh refinement applications, uh, several applications um, in combustion, accelerator physics, cap carbon capture, cosmology applications are using AMREX uh, software uh, uh, framework. Uh, we have recently integrated the HDF5 based IO functions into their uh, reading and writing the plot files and particle data. We compare, they, they previously had, uh, or they still have uh, uh, a native binary format that is custom to their, uh, their analysis tools. Um, compared to that, using HDF5 gives much better performance uh, uh, at larger scale. Uh, we could tune their uh, uh, native format a bit more to get more performance, but uh, as the systems change, the native for a performance, a native format performance may have to be brought up as well. But with HDF5, you have a a standard format, and uh, you can automate. I mean, you can get most of the performance uh, with all the optimizations we are implementing. Okay, going to the next slide. Okay, so this is uh, working with Warpex and QMC Pack applications uh, in the Warpex. Uh, we they were previously using H5Pi, uh, and uh, we noticed that some performance bottlenecks there. Uh, one of the performance bottlenecks was uh, writing to writing to one Luster OST on Cori, and that was giving very low performance. Then we used it multi multiple uh, uh, Luster uh, Luster uh, OSTs, and that got some somewhat better performance. Then we also identified there was a there was a, some bug with uh, a H5Pi, and fixing that bug improved the performance much uh, to a much larger uh, and better performance there. And I'm not going to the details of the bug itself, but if you are interested, let me know and we can discuss those things. And in the QMC pack uh, with, with an older version of HDF5, uh, I think 1.10.1, uh, the read and write performance was much lower. Uh, the time was much, uh, it, it was taking much longer time. Uh, we noticed that, that file flows, uh, during the file flows, um, the, 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 it was taking much longer time because of the truncate uh, call. Uh, and we fixed that in 1102, and now the performance is much better for the QMC pack uh, application. Okay, next slide. And we are working with uh, a, a uh, CFD code uh, that is used heavily at uh, uh, N NNSA applications um, at Sandia and Lanol. Uh, we noticed that they have a, a pattern where all the processes write or read 
uh, from either metadata or the data, which is very small. So that was causing a read and a read or write storm um, that, imp that makes the performance much worse because all the processes are going to the same location in the file uh, and that uh, sequentializes things away and then it, it basically slows down the performance significantly. Going to the next slide, uh, we have one uh, optimization where we uh, made the metadata accesses collective. So uh, what, what's happening here is instead of all the processes going to the uh, uh, same location, uh, only one process goes to that location and reads and broadcasts or uh, collects the um, data and then writes it. Either way, uh, that broadcast and write or read and broadcast, that improves the performance significantly here. So previously when uh, we were going beyond uh, 64 processes, the performance was dropping significantly. And now with the collective metadata approach, the performance is much better. And in the next slide, uh, uh, the, this is about uh, uh, reading small or writing small amount of data uh, instead of, uh, and all the processes are writing the same data. So then, instead of writing, uh, instead of making all the processes write that, so one, one process writes that into a compact storage uh, and that improves the performance by a thousand fold or something. So next, uh, next slide shows that. So the yeah, original performance was much worse. Um, and when we change it to uh, compact storage, uh, we get pretty close to file per processor uh, um, performance with that. And th th this was a much m m uh, larger win. And I believe uh, uh, this was part of the a project uh, outside ECP, but we, we, we are still taking advantage of all those features and adding this into uh, the HDFI library. Okay, going to the next slide. So we are also benchmarking HDFI on uh, the uh, major systems at uh, uh, NERSC and other leadership computing facilities. For example, in this case, uh, I have been benchmarking uh, one VPIC IO benchmark, which writes the data uh, to, uh, from uh, a large number of processes. Uh, so with the, here I show that uh, performance uh, uh, for VPIC uh, writing to Luster on Cori and uh, data warp. So I do this every quarter. So this was uh, something that I observed uh, um, about September of uh, uh, 2019. I, I do see quite better performance uh, around 230 to uh, 240 gig gigabytes per second on both uh, um, Luster and data warp. For some reason, uh, when I uh, switch it to 32, um, 32 megabyte, uh, 32 mega, uh, oh, sorry, 32 K processes, the data warp performance was going down significantly. And uh, when I did the, the latest one, which I'm still running, some of them, um, uh, some of the jobs are still in the queue. I see the performance profile is much different. So we uh, have to investigate why that is happening. Is it the Lustre file system or the data warp file system or uh, the HDFI? Um, so the latest one, I, I can just tell you the, the numbers, but uh, not here. Uh, Lustre was getting about 40 gigabytes per second at the 16K processes. Uh, uh, on the other hand, data warp is getting about 400 gigabytes per second. So they, there is a, a, a completely different view there. Um, so th that is the benchmarking effort that we are doing. Going to the next slide. Uh, we also help uh, some of the applications that we see uh, having problems at facilities. So these are two instances that we're talking about. Uh, the the Astro astrophysics code that was spending 40% of the execution time in IO. Uh, Quincy and uh, Jal and Lou, uh, who was at NERSC, uh, looked into that and they noticed that the collective IO was actually not happening. So they looked at some of the 
uh, introspection interface of HDF5 and identified the bottlenecks um, and uh, re uh, solving that, making sure that the IO is done collectively you know, re uh, reduces that portion to 1% of the execution time. Similarly, uh, another unnecessarily, un unnecessarily um, doing a buffer uh, a copy uh, was taking significant amount of time in the neurological disorder IO pipeline. Uh, they and observing that using the same introspection interfaces, they reduced the uh, reduced the uh, execution time of IO time from 40 minutes to two minutes. So that is a major win as well. All right, going to the next slide. I think th those are all the application related slides. Uh, Quincy will take over to talk about the actual features that we have been developing in the ECB project. All right, Quincy, please. That's great. Thanks, Aaron. Okay, so diving into the more technical details of things. Um, I talked a little bit earlier and showed a slide that, about the HDF5 architecture that showed this virtual object layer um, inside the library. And I can, this is a new capability that we've um, implemented using uh, ECP funding and talk a little bit more about it. It's a really important concept and future expandability option for HDF5. So, this new layer that we put inside the library it drives a distraction or abstraction layer all the way across the API routines that deal with file and, and data set and group object uh, IO into uh, containers. That allows every IO operation to be redirected even at runtime um, and not have to be always using the HDF5 uh, native file format. So these connectors, they, they actually implement the storage or pass through, but I'll talk about that, uh, for the objects. And then they're invoked with callbacks that are effectively methods on those objects. So they'll look more object-oriented level of things like create a data set or read and write data set elements, query things, close an object. Um, they're super beneficial and flexible for applications because they can be transparently invoked um, with a dynamic uh, library with an environment variable. Application doesn't even have to be recompiled. All it has to be is, you know, originally built with a version of HDF5 that includes this vol capability and the 1.12.0 release, which just came out this month, um, has that. And then the app can take advantage of whatever the thing is. You can retarget, storage containers or add capabilities. I'll show a few here um, with this new layer. And it's tremendously flexible. The um, vault connectors themselves, they can be stacked with as pass-through connectors and one or more, um, well, zero or more, um, pass-through connectors can be layered on top of a terminal connector at the very bottom. And right now we've got several uh, pass-through connectors and several uh, terminal ones. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this asynchronous I.O. connector and a connector that allows us to do independent metadata operations on HDF5, leverage the um, burst buffer on Cori and other um, NVRAM storage and, and HPC systems with data elevator. You can interface in Python, um, plugins, connectors, uh, whichever you like, and keep going. And these can all be stacked on top of one another nicely. At the bottom level, we can target different storage formats. And we, of course, ship the one that deals with HDF5's native API and all the library that was currently in development for 20 years. That's all there. Uh, but you can send storage off with the RESTful interface off to Amazon's cloud or to new object storage mechanisms or whatever magical storage thing you'd like to do. Um, any of the terminal connectors, they can store their data any way they like. So the architecture changed quite a bit, but fortunately it's just moving this, all the native stuff down into the native terminal driver and then putting this layer in here and all the other HDF5 routines, they just go into the normal HDF5 infrastructure we really only put this in things that operate in a container. So as an example of that, part of the ECP um, 
funding was to develop asynchronous IO operations for HDF5. This, as this diagram here on the right hand side shows, allows the IO to be overlapped with the application's compute with the goal of taking IO's overhead completely out of the pipeline for an application. They're hopefully in the middle, um, we can overlap the IO completely. And there's always gonna be some final get the last time step out piece, but in general, quite a bit of time savings for an application if they could manage to do their IO asynchronously and overlap it entirely with the compute cycles. So we implement this two different ways. Um, if you don't modify your app at all, and you just you know, link in the asynchronous wall connector, um, the asynchronous IO is transparently invoked, um, what we call implicit uh, asynchronous IO. And it's very conservative, it does all the right things, but there's certain places where it, it waits or it has to like um, make certain a buffer is ready in order to give back to the application because the application doesn't know it's happening asynchronously. Um, still get some nice speed ups, but it's not as good as the explicit mode. And if the apps want more control over the asynchronous operations, they can modify their code some, so they'll have to rebuild, um, and then use the asynchronous operations explicitly inside HDF5 that re return request tokens and then manage those and see when they're completed and things like that when the buffer's available. So this looks similar to this diagram here. The app on the left, starts up, it initializes the asynchronous wall connector, and then performs all its operations. Internally, this is a pass-through wall connector. Um, it fires up a background thread and uses ArgoBots to help manage the um, task management components of uh, the asynchronous IO initiation. Um, all those file open, create an object, write to the object, all that gets put into a task queue internally to the ball connector. And then we monitor and see when the app goes off and is busy computing. And it, whenever that happens, then we start executing IO things in the background for them. So, yep, let's go get these things out to disk while you're off busy running your actual compute simulation code. Um, all happens in the background. We do steal a thread. But um, generally speaking, most apps are beginning to run in environments where there's more cores than um, compute to fill them, they're memory constrained or something else, and they can get, afford to give us a thread to, to operate with. Of course, there's you know, how much memory is the app dealing with and all these other aspects to it. So we, we would like to have more people moving toward the explicit model where they have uh, more control and more feedback into what's happening. But, you don't have to, you can really just plug this in and have your app run as much as it can asynchronously and we're seeing some reasonably good benefits from it. If you do it explicitly, it's even better. Um, modify the VPIC um, IO benchmark so that it would overlap the IO with a simulated compute. It's an IO benchmark, so it doesn't actually have any compute, but basically sleeping in the main thread um, and you can see that if you don't have any overlapping, I'm sorry, we get this blue curve that's basically flat. It's like, yep, yeah, you get the same IO performance and it's you know, pretty constant as you scale up the app. But when you do that and you do the overlapping, you can push the perceived uh, gigabyte per second ratio for your IO you know, up to infinity, right? You know, down to zero time, reduce the cost quite a bit. So you can see the same thing happening over here in the right-hand side with the big cats IO benchmark. So this is some sizable benefits and if apps can modify their code to overlap the uh, compute and the IO and then have enough, um, just a spare core so they can spare a thread, they can get some very sizable benefits. So how does this interact? The graph is backwards, does sorry, this yes, Nick. How does this interact with the uh, buffering that the uh, operating system does? We're agnostic to it effectively. We just, we do, we queue up those HDF5 operations and then wait for the app to go off to um, do its compute and then we start issuing those. So they, they funnel all the way down through the OS's buffering and whatever else would have normally happened. 
Okay, so for the sync, the buffering is still on or not? It's up to how the app would normally do it. We don't we don't expressly change anything. Okay. So another leverage for the ball connectors here uh, is this capability um, called data elevator, right? And this is basically write caching using burst buffers, um, originally on Cori, but as we're you know pushing it out into all the other recent systems that have NVRAM and some mechanism for doing some node local or global um, burst buffering for the system. It's transparent to the application and it moves data in and out of the uh, NVRAM, the burst buffer, um, on its own. The app says, please do that file. And then the data elevator um, component is in charge of moving pieces of that file into the burst buffer um, as it needs them. So um, tested with a particle in cell and the Chumbo IO benchmarks, a um, couple more ECP applications are evaluating the data elevator. So this is relevant to the ECP apps we're seeing um, all along the way. And it's available now on, on Cori. If you really want to experiment with it and you think your app is going to get some good benefits, you can just module load the data elevator and uh, begin you know, getting some benefits or experimenting with it. And you can see here that uh, Cluster in the data warp API and the data warp command itself, and then compared to the data elevator, um, slightly better than the data warp directly, and definitely better than Luster and um, other aspects of the system. Typically, as you scale up, this Luster is coming down, but data elevator is still performing very well. Um, I think at scale, we're limited by the move in, the page in, from or page out in this case too. Um, to the Luster file system on the back end. So this also applies to the read side of things. So if you'd like to bring the data in um, and do analysis, there's a capabilities we've worked on here to, to predict the data accesses based on the history for the application, prefetches them into the faster storage, um, and then tries to, you know, give the app the benefit of these things. You can see over here on the right hand side that uh, this is, you know, a, a big win for against Luster and Data Warp um, in general and quite a bit with uh, the burst buffer and SSDs involved. So again, this was, I'm sorry, this, uh, the data elevator thing is just another vault connector for the app to take advantage of and they don't have to modify their app or maybe add a, a couple of API calls to express their properties to use it or not. Uh, very, very lightweight for the apps. And our final ball connector um, component here that I wanted to mention um, is this independent metadata modification, which is a, a bit obscure in a sense, but um, historically, currently, HDF5 metadata modifications that um, change the namespace, what the file's contents look like, not the raw data elements in the array, but the actual, what are the groups and data sets in here. Um, those must be performed collectively by all the ranks in your ap application. This is a tremendous restriction. It dates back to ASCII Red in the late 1990s and um, the lack of ways to set aside threads and nodes for the application. So everybody did everything collectively and it's kind of been baked in for a while. But with a, a vault connector, we can implement a pass through vault connector and then that does all the stitching together and the voting and everything else that gets all the ranks to eventually trickle out the change that one rank made on the file. So this is a tremendous advantage for applications who are independently modifying the file, more like a file system, um, and less like a, a gigantic, everybody's in lockstep um, making changes to this file. Uh, so architecturally, very much what you'd expect is an HDF5 API, it passes into this independent metadata vault connector and then through the native connector and goes out to disk. Internally to the independent metadata connector, um, it does a lot of work for you. It's 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 
broadcasting that, hey, somebody made a change in here. Is that OK? Everybody gets a chance to vote. Um, it records changes from other ranks and then eventually starts sending those guys out to disk. And we've um, done a considerable amount of work here to get all these pieces working correctly so that the app doesn't have to think about what's going on and we stay out of their way with the way we use MPI and very non-blocking mechanisms. A, a considerably useful piece of this, we haven't leveraged it yet, but the voting manager here and other components of this are pluggable and we will be able to add in and change the mechanism. So instead of MPI for doing the voting, we could use zero MQ or some other interprocess, not an MPI process um, communication mechanism and let more distributed apps start modifying HDF5 files because there's a mechanism for voting and controlling and becoming aware of changes to those files. This really moves us into um, a realm where HDF files are files are, like I say, even closer to a file system. Uh, uh, don't have to be MPI. Yeah. Hey. Hey, David. Um, I think these are really interesting features, uh, the the vault connectors. And is there a? I'm trying to think of what the leading use case is, or a leading use case. Are there any uh, user communities that have picked this up in a distributed sense? You know, I'm I'm more familiar with HDF as a great way to access the the parallel uh, firepower mm -hmm. of a file system, but I'm curious, like in kind of a different, different uh, orthogonal direction, are there people who've kind of jumped on the distributed aspect? Well, there's coincidentally, you know, because I know you work with Slack a lot, um, the kinds of environments from light sources where there's multiple cameras, each wanting to record uh -huh. its data and into a shared structure eventually, um, that kind of, multi-process but not an infinitely num large number of writers um, makes a lot of sense for this kind of architecture. We would use zero MQ instead of MPI or some other mechanism mm -hmm. for you know voting and doing the ledger management um, but it would work pretty well there I would say too. Yeah that, that, that's a good example. I, I have one other one. The, the, the light source example um, I guess it depends on your time frame is probably going to be you know two to three sites or something like that you know in the, mm -hmm. and maybe I'm underthinking it but as an example of something to, to kind of show uh, the the distributed aspect of some of these uh, resilience type features and uh, data management uh, features really um, you you could for instance land a HDF file with a vault connector uh, to distribute uh, super facility information you know so that there was a uh, resource status file in HDF, right? That was maintained via these mechanisms, you know, mm -hmm. um, something like that too. That it wouldn't be solving a scientific workflow per se, but these types of functionalities may be advanced enough that a toy example, you know, that that kind of shines the path for people other than the light sources might be good. Yeah, I agree. Um, the the Vol framework is tremendously flexible. Now that we've got it in place and people are able to use it, we're starting to leverage it out into places I wouldn't have expected. And that's an interesting way to go to agree. Yeah, if you want to pursue it, let me know. Okay, sure. I'll do. All right. So wrapping up the independent metadata modifications, you can see that before um, you had to collectively you know, everybody had to participate in creating all the data sets in the file. There's a lot of overhead, especially as the number of ranks increased. But afterwards, it's like, boom, you know, hey, I want a new data set. I create the data set. I just go. It's very much simpler. And not this crazy um, unscalable mechanism for modifying files. So um, on towards you know lower levels of the storage stack with HDF5, um, one of the features that the uh, team at Argon is is really heavily looking into is exploring and expanding on their topology awareness uh, work that they've done before, and this is a mechanism for putting another at a lower level in HDF5 like virtual file driver, which is down inside the native uh, ball connector. But it's a, a, a replacement for the MPI driver in there. And that's it's a, a version of that that is uses system calls to become aware of, well, just exactly where are the you know interconnects and how is everybody 
all these ranks are on the same node and therefore I can aggregate more quickly from IO or how is the storage interface going and maybe I should ship my data over to that rank because he's closer to the storage system. So that's the exploration work they're doing here and you can see that when done correctly, um, you can get some very nice performance boosts um, and uh, benefits from the, the increasingly stretched out elongated um, storage stack that we're moving towards. Along those lines and a little bit higher up inside HDF5, um, typically um, HDF5 writes to a single file. Uh, that's been a historical mode for things. We have got mechanisms for kind of avoiding that in other ways than subfiling, but um, that's been the norm. And although people do create file per process too. But if you'd like to avoid that, maybe we can do, everybody thinks they're writing to the same shared file, but we avoid the locking contention. That's the overhead for that. Um, so instead of a single shared file, we create a metadata file that describes things a single shared metadata file in that case, but then multiple smaller subfiles um, that are the back end for storing the actual raw data underneath the covers to the user. They won't see it. Um, so hopefully we can kind of combine this with the topology aware thing and we create subfiles that are logically organized according to the topology of the system, um, implementing you know, very nice speed ups, possibly even to no local storage and everything else. Um, and again, this is coming in with the vault connector. It's it's kind of a partial pass through. Right? It passes through all the metadata to a single shared file, but anytime it sees raw data, it sends it out to these other subfiles that it's creating off to the side. Um, looks fairly promising. We're just in the final design stages for this, but it looks very promising. Uh, so let's see, this is the last ECP capability that uh, we'll talk about, I'll talk about. And um, we'd like to give people capabilities to actually like query HDF5 files and sets of files with, you know, real um, query operations. So we added a prototype interface to do H5Q uh, for query creation and then combine queries and then apply those onto a file to get a result set back and um, trying to find good ways to encourage more applications to to uh, use this query and index capability it's a little tough because it's not necessarily one of their built-in i use this all the time many people already have you know flows that they they use for their workflow that's uh, not reliant on this um, and they have different mechanisms for it. So this is a little more prototypey. I'm not entirely certain, but if somebody has a really good use case, I would love to be able to say, yes, this really wins for you. So done with ECP things. Um, we're doing uh, work with experimental and observational data from some funding from Oscar as well. And this does kind of a general bullet list we've got a whole talk about this if you'd like but this is the one of the places where we expect to do that multiple writer um, multiple consumer of the data that like i was mentioning earlier with the independent metadata pluggability um, this is the remote streaming pieces are similar to what david was saying where you could do writing on one local system and be mirroring and sending that over to a remote system and storing it there uh, for analysis and simulation input or whatever um and several other aspects of you know sparse and variable length and streaming modes of data that are being explored as part of this um, as a kind of an enhancement on the uh eod funding that we have we're, we're part of the slack nurse uh super facility that's been funded for a you know a prototype project this year and as part of that we're um developing an xtc2 vol connector again all connectors um, this is a file format adapter vault connector, so it's read-only for now. Um, XTC files are produced by Slack's systems right now, but they're a custom format and they have their own, you know, subset of tools that understand them and it's harder to get larger, you know, communities to um, build off the XTC2 because it's mostly a Slack thing. 
So instead of doing that, how can we open up the XTC to file format and the data that it's producing with, without changing the, the actual data itself? So we're gonna, we're almost done now with a, a vol connector that's a reader and makes all the XTC files look like HDF5. So you'll be able to open up that XTC2 file and do HDF5 API calls. Data set open, data set read, close, look at all the things, get all your data back. And then you open up the much larger HDF5 ecosystem to um, Slack user community. And then the other component of the super facility work is storing variable length data in HDF5 more efficiently. Uh, lots of the data from EOD sources has variability to it in some sense. It's sensor values, or maybe there's some strings in there. Um, and HDF5 supports this, but it's really not been a high performance aspect. It's never been really stressed, and especially not for streaming applications. So we want to design and prototype out, um, improve support for that. And with the goal of getting to the same level of performance for the variable length elements as for fixed size arrays of floats and ints, um, which HDF5 has been optimizing for 20 years. Right now, the redesign looks very, very good. I would say we can probably achieve you know, near disk speed for variable length data, uh, basically constant time access for append and then later iteration. Um, currently, that would be kind of poor in linear time, I would say, um, for variable length and actually better than the logarithmic access pattern we have now for fixed length data. So we'll probably twist the fixed length data to um, take advantage of this for when it's streaming. So that's the last HDF5 thing, just a quick um, blurb about UnifyFS, who's our uh, collaborator for the XIO project. And they are doing um, a lot of work to make no local burst buffers um, look like a single shared file system across all of those ranks that's temporarily you know, set up when the app starts running. And then IO happens and then flushed out to disk. So it's a, it's a um, runtime generated burst buffer, in a sense, a lot like Corey's. And we're working with them to make certain that um, HDF5 has an adapter that works directly on top of UnifyFS and that we don't use POSIX calls that UnifyFS gets, um, you know, doesn't have support for. So it's collaboratively building out both sides of that uh, equation over time. I think that's it. Um, if you need help, there's a great forum for HDF group um, on the HDF group website. There's an actual live help desk and um, mention that you're with the ECP project and they will expedite getting you to the right people. If you have direct questions, uh, Surin and I are, are uh, always available and happy to answer email or talk and set up telecons, whatever. Any questions? Quincy? Yes. yes. What is the status of documentation of Vol right now? It's getting better. Um, Dana Robinson at the HDF group has a draft of the Vol documentation. I'd say it's significantly more coherent than it ever has been. Um, I can point you towards that if you'd like. That would be great. 